Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 227. 227, dos, dos, siete. How you doing? How you feeling? Hope you guys are well. Rested. Hydrated. Hope you guys are good. I'm feeling very fine, as you can tell. Mm, I've just eaten some nice bit of dinner because today I'm not fasting. I've decided to fast three days a week, which is, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I think it's probably the best thing to do stuff for me, in my own personal opinion. But I hope you guys are doing well regardless of that. I'm doing amazing. I'm doing fine. I'm doing good. Diet's going amazing. Working out's going amazing. Everything's going amazing. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling powerful. And I'm feeling ready to blow. Well, not that way, but you know, you know what I mean. But I hope you guys are good, man. Um, I'm coming in strong in a week again, like I said before, right? Actions are actions speak louder than words, right? I could sit here and be like, oh, you know, I've had this issue in my life, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Issues in life doesn't matter. When it comes to uploading, when it comes to clicking that little arrow button and uploading content, you just have to keep going and going and going. And this is what I'm doing right now, right here. Coming at you live and direct, fresh off the plane, fresh off the boat. Talking about planes, actually. Talking about boats. Talking about trips. I'm going to Berlin soon, man. I can't wait. I'm so excited. I'm so, so very excited. You know how excited I am about Berlin? I'm going on Google and I'm rereading loads of articles on Berghain, on Berlin club culture, on just, you know, underground club culture, electronic music. I'm going back and re-watching loads of video interviews from Seth Troxler to Ricardo Villalobos to Richie Horton to Carl Cox, not Carl Cox, but Carl Cox to Jeff Mills to all these other people. I am going in and I'm going and, re- and re-watching, rereading everything that made me so in love with this scene in general because I know that Berlin and the Berghain is only a few weeks away. I just honestly cannot wait. You don't, you don't understand how excited I am. This is like my yearly thing that I do all the time, and I'm going to continue doing it now until I grow old and grey. I think I'm just going to keep going. I think I mentioned before a couple of years ago I went three times in one year without even realizing I'm going to be smashing it out again. I'm probably going to go again before the end of the year. Fuck it, just for a little trip. Because again, like it's so cheap, man. That's the thing. These kind of trips are so so cheap. You don't have to spend that much money. Um. You can probably leave after Friday after work if you want to and just take the Monday off. Um, because obviously, if you're going to go to Bergheim, it, your best bet is to go on a Sunday, right? So you might as well go on Friday, Saturday and just go ch- ch- chill out at freaking Grease Mueller or go to Kit Kat or go to um, um, About Blank. You know, these kind of places and just hang out there for a bit and then go to Bergheim on a Sunday. That's when all the pros go. But man, I feel so good, man. I can't wait. I really can't wait. I'm even brushing up on my German. I even got the Duolingo app redownloaded on my phone because that's how badly I want to go. That's how badly I want to get back involved in the whole Berlin and Spurkheim scene. This time around, though, I'm going to be a little bit more... Um, well, last time was a good trip too, but I think in general, you end up... You know, you end up going to these trips, you end up kind of picking up loose relationships or loose friendships that you think are actually friendships and they're not. You know, they're just kind of like, you know, things that you just pick up along the way when you're in a new place. I'm going to be a little bit less attached to people and just I'm going there for the music. So if I do end up meeting people and stuff, whatever, just, you know, allow it to just be for that moment. That's something I sometimes do struggle with at times. You know, you, you, you have a great moment with someone. You have a great time. You're hanging out. You're going to all these fucking uh, uh, spatties and whatever spatties, however you pronounce it. You're going to these random clubs. They're taking you to these random restaurants. There's all these cool places and amazing donut kebab places and falafel joints. And then you think it can continue, right? And you pick them up again the next year and it's like you get air. You're like, oh, shit. I thought we were friends. No, you're not friends, man. It's just, you know, you met somebody out on a night out and you had a bit of fun. That was it, really. It's not something that you can continue to hold on to like it's an actual friendship. And that's what I tend to do. You wouldn't imagine it, right? Looking at me, you wouldn't think I was that kind of person. But I tend to do that kind of thing a lot, which, you know, probably accounts for why I've got nearly 15,000 Facebook friends, right? Why do I have so many Facebook friends? Because along the way, along you know, along my travels, when I'm out during the night or when I'm, you know, on holiday and shit, I tend to pick up friends at Pokemon cards, right? And then I tend to hold on to them like a loser, you know? It's fair enough having a Pokemon card and, you know, collecting stuff and, you know, having a little passion, but you don't collect, you don't hold on to that shit until you're in your 30s, do you? <laughs> That's a bit weird. It, does that person exist? I know that Pokemon has a bit of resurgence. People are reselling their Pokemon cards, but usually it's because you regretted selling yours. Like I had loads of really good ones that I could probably bend or threw out when I just got over Pokemon. But was there a guy that exists that just kept hold of his Pokemon from when he was young? That's mad commitment. I can't hold. I'm a hoarder, but I, don't, I can't hold that long. 
But anyway, that aside, yeah, I'm really looking forward to Burger and can't wait. It's happening in a couple of weeks and that's it for me. Update. What else am I doing? Oh, on Saturday, I'm playing a little private party though in Dawson. So there's no point even talking about that because you guys won't be able to come. But I'm DJing at a little private um, members club in Dawson for someone's party. I'm not sure who the person is, but um, that should be fun. Gonna be get got gonna get to play a lot of hip hop, R and B, Afrobeat sort of stuff. Stuff I don't usually like to play, but you know, for that's one occasion, I'll make a, a little exception. But it should be good, man. I, it's always a challenge to play that sort of stuff. I don't find it no, I don't find it challenging, but it's a challenge to put that stuff together, right? Because I'm I always maintain that I think in the electronic music scene or in scenes in general, you have to kind of make your little niche and make your kind of nook and cranny where you're gonna kind of you know shine the best. And I think in London, considering just how many good or high level hip hop afrobeat djs that we have out net out there at the moment it'll be stupid of me to come and slip in and kind of you know try and compete on that level i think i need to go on another route whether it's house disco techno um you know afro house that matter that's where i need to be but the afrobeats hip-hop scene there's some fucking killers out there even even a, even the uk funky scene you know the uk funky djs out there you, just, you know just mention fucking dj ez and the whole conversation shut down but there's too many good people there that are just absolutely smashing it so the best place to be is on the other side you know of the whole darker all black queuing outside of Berghain, you know pretending you don't speak any <laughs> english sort of vibe that's what i need to do but i'm looking forward to it. i think it should be good good challenge to kind of see if I can play that kind of stuff. I'm going to have to make a playlist, take inspiration of what people are playing out there, see what I like as well, because I like to have a bit of my personality in the place, not just play like the hits. That's the one thing I used to annoy me when I used to go to hip-hop parties in London. Um, you'd go to these hip-hop parties and they'd just be playing the same shit in a row, right? Back-to-back tunes or back-to-back styles. It was never fresh, never new. And it was annoying because I think that's why I tended to like um, seeing um, Craig Wade, CWD, one of my um, good friends who's kind of a great DJ. I recommend you go check him out, right? Craig Wade, I'm pretty sure that's his name on Twitter too. Um, he was the only DJ we had in London. He was not even, he's, not even a, he's not even a British dude, right? He's from Australia and he's, he's fucking smashing it here, right? And he was the only guy that used to play like actually, like he, he's the only guy who used to play new stuff. So if a new, I don't know, Chief Keith mixtape come out, you for sure, you know, he's going to be sla- he's going to be slipping in the banger during a rave, right? He wasn't afraid of playing new stuff. Whereas all these new dudes were just always playing the same old, old shit, you know, no names mentioned, but you know who I'm talking about. And it just got a bit stale. And I think people probably moved on. I'm not sure what those people do nowadays, that kind of crowd that used to go to those hip hop parties. I won't mention their names because I don't want to put anyone under, under it, but I wonder what they're doing now for nights out. I wonder what those guys do. Maybe they don't go out as much as I do because, you know, I kind of committed myself to the nightlife scene in general especially with the underground electronic scene but i wonder what those guys do for parties and going out and shit because you know don't want to be in a bar where the dj playing the same shit you used to listen to when you used to go to fucking you know um i don't know marketplace or whatever right you want something a bit different a bit fresh but i don't know maybe it's still the same maybe it hasn't changed who the hell knows anyway it's 227 we've got loads of topics to talk through i've got loads of i've got a list of a million items from the internet i've gathered over the last couple of weeks that i want to speak to you about and we're going to try and make this one a good long meaty one as per usual you know we're available now on youtube so check that out if you're listening via the podcast app if you're on a podcast if you're on the youtube check out the podcast app all the links will be in the description for you to subscribe and all that malarkey if you're watching via youtube give me a little thumbs up if it's your first time leave a comment let me know what you think of the show and Let's get into it. Oh, all right. Number one, Bugatti Beebs opens up about um, his drug use and just constant, you know, and just, you know, what fame can do to you. I'm really curious about um, the whole uh, Justin Bieber rebrand or the whole Justin Bieber um, story so far. It's been an amazing one, hasn't it? He's probably, I think nowadays, I think looking back on it, I think maybe with maturity for the internet and maybe for seeing stuff from reality TV shows, I feel as if nowadays people are a little bit more appreciative or a little bit more understanding or are a little bit more um compassionate to the pe- people like justin bieber and kim kardashian i think now that we've seen what celebrity and what influence and what um notoriety and what fame and what you know wealth can do to a person we now appreciate people like a justin bieber who essentially made it when he was what 13 or something or even younger and we appreciate kim kardashian who is essentially been famous all her life right or majority of her kind of you know adulthood for the most part right who's lived to, no, who's lived her entire life in front of the camera we can appreciate just how well adjusted they are as human beings right because we know for sure me and you i know if that was me i would have freaked out a long time ago right i freak out just regularly right and a month if i get paid and i get i don't know and i get giddy 
and I start, you know, calling people that I shouldn't be calling and hanging out with people I shouldn't be hanging out with. And all of a sudden, you know, you know what I mean, right? So imagine how I am as a working dude, right? I get crazy when I get paid, right? Imagine if you're a celebrity and you've got all the time in the world, you've got minders and handlers and security guards and enablers and friends or whatever it may be called who are all around you because you have that aura that kind of um you you emit that kind of vibe that light that draws people in imagine how much of a freak out you'd be and on top of that imagine you're justin bieber and you're a severely attractive dude severely good looking you sing like an angel you dance amazing too right softly spoken from canada for the most part well-adjusted human being imagine your life imagine how difficult your life would be but i'm happy happy to hear that he's been quite open and forthright about his whole issues he's been facing. I'm not sure if this is something that he's doing because he feels like he, he owes his fans or is this part of his recovery? Uh, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, the two-step program allows you to do those kind of things that like speak out loud and kind of ask forgiveness from the public, whatever it may be called, because I think you do it, right? In the uh, two-step two -step program, you kind of ask forgiveness to those around you that you've hurt and then you kind of broadcast that to the wider world as a form of accountability. So maybe that's part of it. Or just maybe he just thought, you know what, people need to see behind the curtain. And plus, I think because a lot of people are still pining and waiting for him to release music or to go back on tour because if he's, he did abruptly stop his tour, you know, convert to Christianity, get married and just kind of, you know, kind of retreat from stardom. So we don't really know what's going on, but it's happy to see he did a little bit of a post on Instagram detailing his experience. This is a post here I've got here on the on the screen. I hope you guys can see it. Um, it's on High Snobiety and it says Justin Bieber just his mental health and drug abuse early uh, fame in a candid Instagram post. This, I'm going to read the post to you now and get up here on another screen. Um, so this is an amazing post from Justin Bieber. And again, super ratings for coming out and saying this out loud, right? Because again, he doesn't owe anyone anything, I think, in the most part. But it's a really... Um, in light, it's really enlightening, enlightening um, post in general. It gives you it gives you a bit of a sneak peek on what it must be like to be this dude day in day out, right? So it's the post that you put on Instagram. It says the following: um, It's hard to get out of bed in the morning with the right attitude when you are overwhelmed with your life, uh, with your life, your past job responsibilities, emotions, your family, finances, your relationship. It feels like there's trouble after trouble after trouble. You start foreseeing the day through lenses of dread and anticipate another bad day. A cycle of feeling disappointment after disappointment. Sometimes it can even go to a point where you don't even want to live anymore. When you're where you feel like it's never going to change. I can fully sympathize with you. I cannot change my mindset. I could not change my mindset. I am fortunate to have people in my life that continue to encourage me to keep going. And that's the one thing you have to really give um, Justin Bieber's family credit for too. Justin Bieber's amazing as he is. His family and his friends around him really deserve a lot of credit because it's not often that you see child stars of his level of stardom, of his level of notoriety, of his level of talent and influence who are surrounded by people who seem quite well adjusted. Apart from the little freak out thing he had with little Flip and a few other people, for the most part, his family, his managers, everyone around him really held him down. Because sometimes it feels as if when you read those stories from like old Hollywood of people kind of, you know, um, you know, flying up into the sun and completely burning out, usually it's because the friends, usually there is an element in the stories where the friends could have easily stepped in and said something and be able to rein them back in, right? Because we all know sometimes more likely than more often than not your friends and family are the ones that are going to keep you on a level playing field right how you hear so many times from celebrities football stars right that they keep around them the people that they've known since childhood because they're gonna be the ones that kind of you know knock them down a peg where they're feeling a little bit too you know when they get a bit too big-headed but sometimes as well you know because you're paying those guys rent or you're in or you're, you you've kind of changed their circumstances or you know you're You've got them around you to just roll weed or whatever and just you're paying them your own salary or whatever. It doesn't, I can't blame the friends too for being a little bit of a sheep and not kind of, you know, standing up and telling your friend, hey, you got to chill out. So to have friends in your circle who are not afraid of maybe getting excommunicated, because it happens a lot too, right, celebrities, when they get called out of their shit and they kind of get exposed by their friends, they can sometimes retreat and push everyone away and then no one can help them. But for Justin Bieber to, number one, be receptive to the conversation, be receptive to constructive criticism, and for his friends to have the courage to say it to a mega superstar like him is really really big look and i think that's the real key to it like these people around him people will say there's the people around people around you no in his case there's the people around him that save his life for sure because if if not we know how the story could have ended um i unfortunately have people in my life that continue to encourage me to keep going you see i have a lot of money clothes cars accolades achievements awards and i was still unfulfilled 
Have you noticed the statistics of child stars and the outcome of their lives? There is an insane pressure and responsibility to put on a child whose brain, emotions, and frontal lobes decision making aren't developed yet. And that's true, right? I think a guy's frontal lobe isn't developed until they're 28. I think women is like 25, right? And that's your decision sense making part of your brain. So when you see young dudes freaking out and acting a fool for the most part, like there's a common trope, right? You see of like girls having these really intelligent, fun, really intelligent thoughtful deep conversations around the dinner table around a table around a bar somewhere and then the next scene you cut across a, a group of boys just beating their chest burning themselves with a lighter and just acting a fool right that's because usually guys have not matured that well right in the front or lower right the decision making process doesn't mature that well and guys are going to be guys now imagine that pressure on a dude not on a dude a child and he's got the entire you know he's essentially looking after a whole group of people that's the one thing i've noticed a lot when I read or listen to entrepreneurs, the one thing they always speak about is that running a business isn't just about running a business and ensuring you make profit and whatever it may be. The most, the most stressful part of running a business is the idea that you're essentially looking after all these people. You're paying their rent. You're essentially paying their mortgage. You're essentially putting their children through school. So that insane amount of pressure of knowing that these people are depending and counting on you can sometimes ebb away at you, which is why the biggest, you know, the commercial sense for entrepreneurs would say that entrepreneurship should be treated like athletics, right? Some people are made for it, some people aren't, because that's where the real pressure is. Because probably, for the most part, most people could run a successful business if you've done the education and you did the homework and you had enough money to kind of, you know, do enough experiments, quote unquote. But to actually be able to manage people to get them to cajole them around an issue or to around a product around a service that they did they, they, they hadn't invented they're not really that passionate about but to get them to do it with all their might and also to have that pressure on you day in day out is something that i would not wish on anybody i would assume let alone a, a kid a teenager right um da, da, da. no rationality or defiant rebellious things all of us have to go through but when you add the pressure of stardom it does something to you that is quite unexplainable you see, I didn't grow up in a stable home. My parents were separated when I was eight. Um, were eight were eighteen, separated with no money, still young and embarrassed as well. As my talent progressed and I became ultra successful, it happened within a strand of two years, which is very true, right? He went from singing in his bedroom to suddenly being on Ellen within a space of two years, which is even you know a longer period of time. Considering like you know, look at someone like six nine, right? He's obviously going through what he's going through, but his kind of rise was essentially what most kids want right he went from being a complete nobody to suddenly getting collaboration with kanye west and having an album with Nicki minaj on it right like just insanely successful um by 20 i made every bad decision you could have thought of and went from one of the most loved and the most adored people in the world to the most ridiculed judged and hated person in the world being on stage according to the studies is bigger dopamine rush than almost any other activity so these massive ups and downs of their own are very bad to manage you notice a lot of touring bands and people end up having a phase of drug abuse and i believe it's due to not being able to manage the ups and downs that come with being an entertainer of course man imagine what that must feel like being just a beaver walking out to an arena of 30,000 people screaming a name night in night out right and in the background you've got this internal turmoil right it's like an absolute you know thunderstorm erupting in your mind and your soul then you've got all your family problems your friend problems what people you grew up with media gossip whatever it may be called tmz cameras outside your van wow man um I feel I could never. Uh, I started doing pretty heavy drugs at 19 and abused all my relationships, which we were obviously, you know, we were aware of from the outside looking in. I became resentful, disrespectful to women, angry. I became distant to everyone who loved me, and I was hiding or hiding behind a shell of a person that I had become. I felt like I could never turn it around, and it's taken me years to bounce back from all these terrible decisions, uh, fix broke relationships, and change relationship habits. Luckily, God bless me. Oh, God, pause it for one second. When someone knocks and you have no idea who it is someone buzz the door in my flat as you could have heard that and i don't know who it is great thank you for the heads up as you do for the most part doesn't make any sense does it anyway um let's continue on people always kind of just try and disturb you when you're doing stuff and it's like come on mate you can't disturb me when i'm doing stuff let's go back here oh, bs cool okay let's go back on the screen i was hiding behind a shelf of person all this to say even when the uh the odds are against you keep fighting jesus loves you be kind today and be told 
uh, today and love people today, not by your standards, but by God's perfect unfulfilling love. So again, a really wholesome message from um, Justin Bieber. Again, I wish him nothing but, you know, a clean recovery. Um, that journey is going to be a long one. Um, I'm sure he's feeling pressure from the fans to kind of get back on stage, but this is when he needs time to really recover and really um, repair himself from all the damage and the stress that he's taken over the years. And in general, too, I think the more time he's given, the better his story will be when he comes off, when he comes out of it from the other side. And if he doesn't have to come out of it, the other side and can spare himself, then so be it too. But I think in general, we want our biggest stars, our most influential stars, to be um, well adjusted, right? We've lost enough amazing entertainers over the years to not have this issue kind of repeat itself again and again and again this is not what we need so yeah um congratulations to, well congratulations to justin for being so brave to point that stuff out there from the first place because again he doesn't owe anyone explanation but if he wants to then fair enough i completely understand where he's coming from okay next on the list here we have she said what Let's do she said. You know what? Yeah, let's say she said. She said a book on a revolution. This is a quite a good one, actually. Let me actually know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up here and actually close this door just in case no one comes up again. Bear with me one second, though. Don't even buzz in my door once more because that's annoying. All right, and we're back. Cool, there we go. Camera right there. So now you need recording and someone's buzzing in the door. I should probably put it, I should probably put the, the locker thing on, on airplane mode or whatever it may be called, but I didn't want to be rude. But anyway, so let's get on to the next topic. There's a book coming out. There's a book coming out, and it's going to cause a whole lot of trouble for people that are in, that have been mentioning it. So as you guys are aware, the Me Too movement, when did it start? A couple of years ago, or maybe a few years ago, um, has, you know, essentially been an amazing driving force in order for women in Hollywood, for the most part, entertainment industry, to speak up about, you know, uh, you know, douchebag dudes or douchebag men in power, kind of taking advantage of them in order for them to kind of progress their careers, right? It's just really, really, really sad um, thing that was turned into a good thing by his women kind of banding around and getting people like Harvey Weinstein the fuck out of here, right? But there's this book that's going to do to come out that's revealing some interesting things about some of the key characters that are involved in the whole Me Too movement. And again, it's, it surprised me in some respects, but also hasn't surprised me because I guess entertainment industry, you should be ne you should never be surprised. You know, Every, everything is up to interpretation. So this book is called She Said, right? And it's a title from NPR. It's an article from NPR. I'll link it to the show if you guys check it out. She said is a book by a uh, Jody Cantor and Megan uh, Tauhi, right? And uh, uh, and here's here's the piece from NPR, which is really interesting. Um, they wore parkas to meetings or two pairs of tights. They travelled in pairs. They feigned phone calls and hid in bathrooms. They said no. They changed careers or industries. They accepted settlements, thinking it was uh, the most justice they were ever likely to see. Many women who worked in Hollywood producer. Um, Harvey Weinstein said that they waged uh, desperate tactical battles to escape his alleged sexual predation, uh, predation without spending, without upending their own lives. In 2017, the New York Times reporter Jody Cantor and Megan Talhi broke the story that ended Weinstein's alleged reign of terror and helped to ignite the Me Too movement. Their book, she said, tells the inside story of their remarkable reporting from the first explanatory phone calls to a mountain trail of evidence to a final face-off with the belligerent Weinstein at the New York Times headquarters. They wanted, they wrote, to leave a lasting record of Weinstein's legacy, his exploitation of the workplace to manipulate, pressure, and terrorize women, which is amazing, right? Because I think for the most part, even if Weinstein ends up getting away with it, right? Because, you know, the evidence is proving that he's a rich dude and you'll probably end up, you know... um delaying this fucking decision for years and years litigation after litigation law after lawyer you end up going after people discrediting them whatever you called even if he doesn't spend any time behind bars the fact that this issue was kind of wrote um spoken about in public and everything was kind of exposed i, I think my dad always said right every um what's hidden in the dark will get exposed to the light right so now it's being exposed to the light and everyone knows what a kind of creep he was it's essentially it's essentially uh, made all the other creepos kind of hide away, run away, change their ways, or essentially just, you know, completely stop what they're doing, which is great as well for the future um, generation coming up. They don't, they don't hopefully have to go through what the previous generation had to go through in order to make it in Hollywood. And I guess nowadays, with the advent of the smartphone too, maybe this will not be a thing that will be repeated as often, right? Because, you know, back then with gatekeepers and staff, with gatekeepers and stuff, right? 
women are put in such a precarious position where essentially your career was hinging on if you're not you were willing or not to engage in these lewd sexual acts with this person right but now there's with the, with the smartphone and with the evidence of the internet and just in general the industry the way it is and there's loads of women collective of directors and screenwriters and stuff there's loads of kind of support groups that are able to kind of allow women to navigate through these weird industries without you know getting exploited it's a lot better you hope it's a lot better but the really interesting part about it forget all that right is this part there's a bit in here um, that really, really uh, threw me off to a bloom. Where is it? It's about the the, the bloom lady, right? Let's see if I can find that. Where is she? Cool. Here it is, right? So um, she said, so it's, it's, here's a bit that really popped out to me. That I was like, oh my God, this story gets weirder and weirder the more you flip and hear about it, right? So she said, the book about the Me Too movement. So it continues on, the article from NPR says the following. She said, there's also a story of both tremendous cowardice and tremendous bravery. Cantor and Taui showed the impersible imper apparatus of power, um, impenetrable or impersible, whatever it's called, uh, that protected Weinstein. Companies, uh, self-preservation and incentive lawyers um, get to persuading their clients to sign NDAs. Cantor and Taui argue that even some advocates for women profit from the settlement system that covers up misdeeds. They single out Lisa Bloom. And if you're wondering who Lisa Bloom is, that's a lady that's always kind of got her arms around uh, victims, sexual assault victims or high profile, especially mostly women um, who are kind of accusing uh, somebody else over crime or whatever. I think she had the lady that was pictured with Black China. I'll, I'll get a picture of her actually now, so you can see I'm talk, what I'm talking about. But she's kind of front and center whenever there's kind of a big high profile case involving some sort of like lady, right? So here she is, this lady, Lisa Bloom, right? This lady that's always got her arm around people. This lady who's kind of like kind of acting as if the she's the how do you call it? the um the protector of, of all women that go through these, you know, ab abhorrent crimes was actually benefiting from all this situation because she was protecting Weinstein. She was, uh, she was one of Weinstein's several lawyers that, that he, he was basically using in order to kind of smear the ladies that were accusing him. Absolutely insane. So it says the following, um, the reports include a confidential memo in which uh, Lisa Bloom promises to help discredit Weinstein's accusers, particularly Rose McGowan. That's a lady here with a short hair who kind of had a book that just came out recently, right? Uh, I think it's called Brave. So Lisa Bloom, the lady that was kind of out there championing all women and protecting them and kind of, you know, putting her arms around them in press conferences was actually the one that was getting paid by the YNC to discredit <laughs> Rose McGowan. And Rose McGowan was always talking that there was this big machine in the background that was sniping women and discrediting them. And we thought she was cuckoo. We thought she was nuts. We thought she was just going crazy. But no, Rose McGowan was right all along. There were these higher ups in the positions of power that were actually trying to make her seem like she was completely nuts. She might be a little bit nuts, but not nuts in terms of making up complete stories about people actually blackballing up in the industry. It's insane. Um, so um, it says the following. Um, she said, the member said the following, right? This is Lisa Bloom's allegedly talking. It says, I feel equipped to help you against the roses of the world because I have uh, represented so many of them. She proposes a um, counter ops online campaign to push back and call her out as a pathological liar. We can place an article or um, Ari her becoming increasingly unhinged or unglued, sorry, so that when someone Googles her, it's the what that pops up. And I noticed that a lot with Kevin Hart, right? Because Kevin Hart's going through a bit of a d dodgy issue now with the whole car crash thing, right? And allegedly people are saying that it doesn't seem kosher. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it's all about board. The whole car crash, what happened during it. But if you Google Kevin Hart right now, right, on your phones and you just check whatever, you won't find any conspiracy theories about his accident. All you'll find are really kind of glowy reports about he's doing well, he's on the mend. It'll be The Rock making a comment, his wife making a comment. There'll be nothing about conspiracy theories maybe until you get to maybe page five or six. But for the most part, for the general public, that's how we make our mind our minds up, right? We just quick, we just do a quick Google. We have a snapshot of the news. We find out this lady, this kind of crazy famous woman, is nuts and she's unhinged. She's coming off the seams. She's uh, she's coming apart from the scene. But in the reality, these lawyers have actually placed these stories in these publications in order to discredit this lady right to kind of make her case uh less to have to make her case let hold less weight so that when eventually this come this comes out because most of these cases are judged in the court of public of public opinion uh, right they're not really judged in court but if, if it does most people are going to write her up as the crazy old feminist lady insane 
Um, and it says of the following um, of her mother, the famed feminist lawyer Gloria Allard, they write, while the attorney cultivated a reputation for giving female victims a voice, some of her work and revenue was in negotiation, was in, was, was in negotiating secret settlements that silenced them and hurried, um, buried allegations of sexual harassment and assault. But the book has quite, um, this, <laughs> that's in, again, that's insane. But it also goes to show just how, um, murky and how weird and how seedy that whole hollywood scene is because i don't think anyone for as bad as harvey weinstein is and he's abhorrent and he's you know he deserves to get buried under this prison if everything that was written about him is true as bad as he is i don't think anyone's under any under i don't think anyone is under any illusions that he's was operating on his own volition that he was just operating as a sole entity they didn't have anyone else being in the background pulling strings helping him out securing him talent so so putting him in the right places, um, putting in the right word for him. I don't think anyone is that stupid to suggest that he was doing this all on his own, that no one else had a clue, no one else was involved. We know they were involved. We know they were higher-ups. You know, if you listen to all these comedian podcasts I listen to, they were saying that, you know, there were rumours about Harvey Weinstein from a long time ago, right? And people were saying, you know, if you had your friend, a female friend was going to see him for an audition or whatever, you'd go along with them, right? As kind of, as a chaperone, just to kind of make sure things are okay. It was a, it was a kind of a well-known secret that Harvey Weinstein was a bit of a creep, allegedly, right? So it's unlikely that he would operate in that industry, which is very small, very gossipy, and people weren't aware or people weren't enabling him in no sense. But you wouldn't have guessed it would be someone like Elisa Bloom. You wouldn't have guessed it would be somebody that stands next to a black China at a press conference when she's suing Rob Kardashian and is like, I'm going to help her out. She's a good... You would expect someone like that. You expect it was, you know, an agent or a manager, but not Lisa Bloom. And again, it goes to show just how dicey that whole, um, um, that whole thing is, right? Because I think there is a feeling that if this does go to court, and Hype Weinstein has to kind of stand trial that he's going to absolutely call out everybody in the industry, right? And we're going to hear some names that we're probably going to be unaware of, uncomfortable to hear in that kind of associated with him in that kind of sense because it's unlikely, it's just impossible that he did his all on his own. He had some help. He had some assistance. Somebody turned a blind eye. And when we find out who it is, oof, that's, and, and again, I think that's, that's, that's a mark of a person with real character and real honor and real moral compass. If you're in that if you're in that space and you see that shit happening around you, what do you do? This is Harvey Weinstein, right? This is the guy that, you know, he's essentially the power broker of Hollywood. If you've got real character and real moral um, compass in you, you won't care who the fuck he is. You'll call that shit out. You'll leave the room. You'll taste say something. You'll you'll help out somebody if they're going through something. You will do something, you'll stand up for something. But if not, and you're willing just to kind of pick up a check and you're just worried about your own career and you're selfish in that regard, right? You don't care about anybody else. You're self-centered. The world will own your involves around you. Guess what you do? You conveniently just stare at your little Prosecco glass, your little Prosecco flute, and kind of hope that the situation goes away. But it doesn't go away. Everyone's going to be accountable for it. Everybody. It seems like everyone's going to be accountable for it. And again, I think in the future, it's good because it, what it shows now is that kids nowadays, you know, you're going to have to be a bit of a doofus to get put in that position again, right? To get To have a dude kind of get you in a change room in a fucking bar for a reading lines no one's gonna have it anymore even the most naive of girls is not gonna have it they're gonna be like what no i'm not gonna do that do you know what i mean and that's the benefit of it but what a crazy story i'm definitely gonna check out the book i recommend you do too actually because i think it's gonna cause some uh, interesting things happen when it goes to trial the book's there on screen it's called she said it's by a jody cantor and a megan Towie. um it's uh the subtext says breaking the sexual harassment story that helped ignite a movement so yeah really definitely check it out it's already won a pulitzer prize i'm not sure how it won because it hasn't even come out yet but you know book prize book prizes are weird like that I recommend you check it out probably available now at all good book stores all right next on the list we have here what do you have on the list come on go through wind it all down okay so a kind of interview with um kim kardashian i really enjoyed this interview i thought this was very cool very sweet of them i really like the pictures i think kim kardashian looks amazing and the images i think kanye um and kim are obviously great compliments to each other and it just seems like they're madly in love again this is something a trope that you're going to hear quite often but you know kanye has been through some interesting times as of late we all know this kim also in some regards but you know the thing with Kanye, the more the older you get, from my I'm only can speak for myself, and the more I've, I've been exposed to you know actual intellectuals, and I've been reading a lot more books. I don't really. I think when I was younger, I I kind of saw 
this sounds stupid to say, but I kind of maybe saw um, Kanye as a living embodiment or, you know, somebody representing a kind of Jordan Peterson character, right? Somebody that kind of was well read, done all the research, presented to this really thought out opinion. And was, I don't know. I, I, I had a, I have, I felt um, Kanye had a more of an influence in my day to day life than he, than he does nowadays, right? Because I was young. I didn't really know. I didn't have any, any other frames of references that I was kind of latching onto or soaking in. But now that I have more frames of reference, whether it's through my own life or through the books I'm reading, the films I'm watching, the documentaries that I'm viewing, or whatever maybe called the podcast I'm listening to, I can kind of, kind of, box Kanye in that entertainer musician um you know just cultural influencer cultural you know force whatever you may be called I, he can just be in that box for me so his general everyday politics stuff I don't really care about anymore so I can I can definitely be in a position where I can separate the art from the artist and because of that I really see from the look and reading this interview reading between lines like they are madly in love and I think it's really cool to be now to be in a, in a day and in, in a day and age where public no celebrities are putting their relationship out in public they're you know kim kardashian has changed her name to kim kardashian west it's a very kind of traditional kind of thing they have they have a big family they've got four kids right they put them front and center they put them front and center on social media which i'm not really a fan of but you know everyone's got the way of doing things it's a complete family business with the kardashians and their show and all the other businesses that are spawned off of it I really like that this is the era that we're in, right? So much so that the younger kids coming up want to have girlfriends, right? They want to have relationships. Lil Duck being a good example of it, right? He wants to have a girlfriend. He's showing off his girlfriend that he's on and off with on social media all the time. People are looking to like get married, look, get into, look, get into have kids. Um, when someone gets divorced or splits up, it's a big deal, right? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Before it was like a, it was like a bit of a comedy show, a bit of a circus. People were just laughing at them, thinking, oh, how long is this going to last? But now people are rooting for people's relationships, right? They want people to stay together for longer and whatever it may be called. Look at PewDiePie, right? Good example of that too. Like there's great, it's a great era, I think, nowadays for that because the example it's showing to everybody else is so amazing. Like there's not that many, there may be a few, but there's not many, high level kind of like playboy type characters are going around smashing everything that moves right and if they do they don't really look to as heroes as they were in the past which is amazing too it's a good development but again i think this story is a good example of it kind of essentially just completely giving kim kardashian the floor allowing her to take front and center and him just kind of asking some really cool probing questions the whole interview is really cool i, I recommend you really check it out loads of great candid pictures loads of stuff about how um, loads of um, insights into how much Kim appreciates Kanye's influence in her style and everything, which I thought was really sweet. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, this thing really, really stuck out to me as well about the law. Kim, Kim Kanye asks her the following. Maybe you underestimate how other people see you. I think other people are expecting someone else. Um, Kim Kardashian says the following. But misconceptions, for example, my mind is so focused right now on law school. There is some misconception that I don't really have to study that I bought my way into getting into a law degree. That's absolutely not true. I have put in just as much time as everybody else. I work the same amount of hours that they're required by law, and I have to write essays, take tests, and actually pass them. There are no shortcuts. There is no easy way out, which is amazing, right? Because if you look at it, she's got more money than God. She can, you know, she doesn't need to do this. And I think, in general, maybe it's because as a society, we're maybe asking more from our celebrities and our icons and our famous people. But I don't really think that's true. I think there's enough famous people out they're not doing anything they're just enjoying their riches um but it's really commendable that she's willing to step into the fire into the ring of fire and put herself forward for law school because if she fails what happens then right the the amount all the haters that are out there that want them to fail will be out with their daggers and shit but in that imagine she's kind of you know driving for the the prison reform freeing loads of people she freed that you no know, the first lady she freed she featured her in her in her skims um editorial She's now doing a law degree in order to kind of further um, help these people that are in prison for um, non, what's it called it? What they call it? Non, non, for, I forgot what it's called, like non-offensive kind of charges. Like just stuff that you don't need to do if you're Kim Kardashian. I know for sure if I was Kim Kardashian, I probably wouldn't do it, right? She's a much better person than me. Because I think if you, if, I think if you came, if you started off as an everyday person and you got to be as famous and rich as her, then maybe I'd understand it. But she's been quite well to do pretty well off middle class for the most of her career right surrounded around those kind of hollywood industry people so for her to now suddenly come come down and uh or to come down from her kind of high horse per se and and adopt some sort of civic responsibility 
is really commendable, man. Honestly, it's super commendable. I really do. I really do rate her for doing it in general. I think it's something that people would look back on. Again, these people, I think we're always going to appreciate them when they're gone, unfortunately. They look back on and think, wow, she didn't need to do it and she actually did it. Um, so there's a following, da, 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 loads of cool pictures of them together, which is really sweet. You can even tell the way they're looking at each other. They love each other to death. Um, some people say fame is addictive. What are your views on that? Kim Kardashian the following. I do agree that fame can be addictive and it took me a long time to recognize how lost you can become when you put so much focus on it. People often ask me, money or fame? My focus has always been on success and with success comes money. I'm at this place now where I'm not concerned anymore about fame. But if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I probably would have said that fame and money were equal importance. My focus has shifted a lot, which is true. I think everyone in general has as well. I think you've seen it a lot on social media, even with influencers. There has been a bit of backlash around influencers that are obviously going for the money, right? I think the influencers that usually do the best, that have the kind of best fan reaction and kind of have the most influence and have and are really pushing um, that whole scene forward are the ones that are able to just do what they do well to a really good level and then the money follows, right? But the ones that are just, you know, chasing the views, chasing the money, accepting anything that comes along their table are usually the ones that are kind of derided by everybody else. And again, that's short-lived because that's not something that can last not something that can scale either. If you're Kim Kardashian West and you've kind of suddenly decided to pull away from the fame, which you can probably capitalize on tenfold and decide to kind of go down this route of actually building businesses and helping people, um, whatever maybe could behind the scenes, in the scene, it's just amazing. Again, really, really commendable to see. This is an article from Vogue at Arabia. I'll link it to you again in the show notes if you guys to check out if you're interested. But again, really cool interview. Kim Kardashian, Kanye interviews Kim. Some really good pictures too. I recommend you check that out. What's next on the list here? Let's make sure we are free. Also, this is shit. Um, oh, Virgil Abloh's taking some time out, man. Um, I, I what you call it? Wishing him all the best and all that malarkey. But this news broke, I think, last yesterday or last night. I saw it pop up. Um, so I guess all of that hard work, all of that effort that he's been doing over the years, has finally caught up with him. I think. For the most part, there were a few people I would... A few, few people? I'm not, I wouldn't say a few people. Let me just take it off the screen now. One there. Maybe there are some people out there that are kind of rejoicing at the fact that he's kind of, you know, taking some time off, but, which is kind of, you know, if that's you, then you need to kind of give your head a wobble and you're an absolute sicko if that is the facts. But hopefully not. I think most people are appreciative of just the amount of what he's been able to do. But Virgil Abloh has decided to take some time off. He's not going to be attending any of the shows, I think, in Paris, right, for Off-White and Louis Vuitton. He's going to take a few months off to kind of, you know, rejig and then kind of get back, I guess, designing for Full Winter 2020, um, which kind of makes a lot more sense in general. But, yeah, man, um, the hardest working man in fashion is finally, it's finally caught up with him. He finally decided to take some time off. And I took a hear from Vogue that kind of details the whole experience. Um, on those of all, the Virgil Abloh has taken a few months off and will not attend his Paris Off-White show. Virgil Abloh, the famously busy founder of Off-White and men's artistic director of Louis Vuitton, a guy who flies internationally eight times a week, is officially slowing down. I'm shifting gears, he told Vogue over the phone today from Chicago. In August, he explained he was having a harder time than usual um, bouncing back from the overseas trip. I was just tired, so I went to the doctor. Ultimately, he continued, everything is fine, but the doctor told me this place, uh, you've got yourself pushing your body to fly all these miles, to do all these different projects is not good for your health. Abloh declined to go into specifics about his health issue, but did say that his doctors have advised him to not travel. Essentially, I'm going to work from home for the next three months, and in large part, all my marketing events I'm cancelling. That includes public appearances with Ikea and Nike and participation in Vogue's third annual Forces of Fashion Summit, as well as a November opening of exhibition Figures of Speech at the High Museum in Atlanta. So again, a really cool... um, um, end to kind of a really cool end to that kind of story i think in general because you know it's not often that um designers or celebrities or people of notoriety take on doctor's advice right you can hear what doctors say but you just think you know what fuck it you know what you're talking about i need to keep hustling but again i guess it's also an interesting uh thing situation to be in because i think there is this there is this assumption that i got this feeling right when he was really not with him let's say Ariana Huffington, right? Yeah, Ariana Huffington. This is the way it comes into. She really annoyed me when she put that book out about sleep, right? Because it was this lady that's a multi-billionaire or have whatever much she's worth, essentially telling us commoners that in the, the secret to success, the secret to building your own Huffington Post is to sleep eight hours a day, which is a bit disingenuous, right? Of course, she's not saying that. I'm kind of reducing her 
book to you know the lowest common denominator but essentially there was a movement i felt as if like a couple of years ago of all these really big icons and really big entrepreneurs and successful people coming out and telling us that eight hours of sleep was the key to their success no the key to your success was working at relentless breakneck speed 24 hours a day seven days a week for 10 years straight without a break and then when you reach that level that you wanted to you start taking eight hour naps because you can right you've got more people around you that can do the jobs that you you don't you what you are doing all on your own you have minders helpers assistants companies you have structures processes set up that are able allow you to kind of sleep for eight hours but when you're virgil when you're screen printing t-shirts when you're printing 23s on the back of rugby flannels and flipping them for however much you're doing when you're designing album covers helping out kanye um, whatever it may be called interning at fendi you need to work at the level that he's worked to to get to louis vuitton he couldn't have got to louis vuitton he couldn't have got his brand off white to level it's been to now without working this hard yes it's kind of hit the wall and he's kind of hit he's kind of quote unquote treatment wall and there's a kind of recalibrate but this isn't a time to kind of look at it and say oh you see now the pressure of the industry means that people have to take more time no the industry is the industry right carl lagerford one of our biggest icons passed away unfortunately recently and he was an he was an absolute workhorse talented influential uh mercurial talent one in a generation yes but at the heart of it he worked hard until the very last day that he passed away i think he's even got a story about his great grand being a ballerina was his mum being a ballerina and she kind of won it or a dancer and someone said oh when will you retire and she said oh i'll retire in my studio right oh she she her dream was to kind of like kneel over and die in her studio while she's working right that was the actual dream like i'm doing what i love this isn't work i want to i want to die where i'm most i'm most at peace um so for virtual to be in a position where he's finally having to reach that wall it makes sense but it's also a bit of a cautionary tale for the youngsters coming up because as much as people might rib on him for his design being a bit reductive and a bit copy pasty and not well done and whatever may be called you might not like him you might not like his personality his people hang around with you cannot deny that the only way to reach a level of success that he's reached within this short period of time too because think about it it's been a long you know he, he will say 10 years he's been in the game he's done his hours but essentially he's been able to blow or to be as successful as he's been into what maybe in the last five years maybe in the last six years that's kind of like to go from you know a well-known streetwear dude to the fucking leader of the new school in fashion to 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 make that kind of run and to achieve what he has to achieve he's had to have done this this is this was the natural end this is what had to happen in order to get to that level so again it's a cautionary tale for those of you kids out there that are like oh i can do what virgil does oh he's not he's not good he's not talented okay cool take his seat do that right because i'm sure part of the reason why this also got stressful was all the collaborations i think balancing off-white and louis vuitton you know as a brand is difficult don't get me wrong but then when you add on to the fact that he's like the master collaborator right anyone who's anybody that he thinks is talented he will want to associate himself with make some cool products with capture collection whatever it may be called that's probably what ran him down the ground and then when you add on top of that he's djing right he fucking dj at coachella he essentially did a, an entire summer <laughs> an entire summer residency in ibifa right which is you know you only have to listen to a couple of resident advisor exchanges to hear how difficult it is to dj in ibifa during the summer right how the amount the toll it takes on you physically and mentally this guy's designing for two big fashion houses right um, a, a storied and well regarded and you know a very prestigious job in louis vuitton and also his own brand that he's also built up to this insane level and on top of that he's djing and on top of that he's collaborating like and on top of that he's giving speeches he's organizing retrospective um art exhibitions that he's going to take on tour it's insane the amount of work he's done over the years but again i think it's the only way he would have been able to land this louis vuitton job was to do this but also for the industry overall maybe it's a good thing too for the industry to say you know what how far are we willing to push our designers how much how far are we going to take them how far are we going to push them over the edge until they get reached a break break they reach a point they reach a breaking point we have to realize um look up to john galliano john galliano essentially blamed that whole entire freak out with his weird anti-semitic anti-sem anti-semitic views when he was kind of being a bit you know a, a little bit nasty in that cafe in paris he blamed it because of fatigue right a bit of exhaustion right he got pushed to the brink hedy semaine right same sort of thing too like how far do we want to push our designers how far do we want to push these people because essentially they are the ones because like in all industries right there's the top five percent of people or the top one percent maybe top five or top ten percent of designers out there who are really 
pushing it, who are really setting the tone for trends, fashion, whatever it may be called, right? They're the ones setting the pace. We need those people around. We need them. We don't need to be pushing them to the edge. So again, industry, will it take a hard look at itself and kind of change tack? Probably not. Because there's loads of designers out there who are more than willing to able to you know to work under their desk and ungodly hours and run himself into the ground. But you know, after watching the Alexander McQueen documentary and just seeing how much he put himself through it and what the industry did to him and what it turned him into, how he's affected his friends and family, I don't want to see that happen to anybody else. So if Virgil has to take some time off to relax and to get his mind back right, that's okay with me. And if it means he comes back and he's a whole different person and he's eschewing a different sort of mentality, a different sort of message, hopefully he doesn't come out and start talking about eight-hour sleeps and meditation. Hopefully he's able to tell people, look, if you want to be as successful as I am, right, because I think people have weird delusions of grandeur about their am- level of ambition doesn't match their effort. I think Gary Vee talks about it a lot, right? You want to be a Virgil, but then you work two days a week. It's like you can't do that. You have to be moving you have to be moving as much as he is or maybe more. So I feel hopefully when he comes back from this um, from this break, he's able to kind of delve into it and say, look, I reached a certain point in my career where I'm able to do all these things on my own and fly around and do it. But there has to be a point where he has to be able to rein it back in again. Because there are some people, some good critics actually, that were saying that that was part of the reason why some of his designs were kind of suffering and his collections weren't as good because of the DJing stuff, right? He was too distracted. Um, which makes sense, right? I think even in MMA, they say a lot, right? In MMA, they always say like, you know, the moment the fighter starts appearing on TMZ and doing loads of media stuff and doing a podcast and just running around doing anything but training is a moment they're going to die. Because whilst you're out there, you know, out on TMZ talking about whatever happened in pop culture, your opponent is in the gym training, right? That's what they're doing. They're just, they're just on that heavy bag. Boom, 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 boom. So imagine in design, right? Or imagine in fashion, the same sort of thing in the creative field, right? Whilst you're swanning around at some sort of press junket, DJing in the middle of Ibiza, playing at Coachella, playing at Burning Man, uh, doing a collaboration with Ikea, that kid, that designer is at home just crafting, crafting, honing their craft, pattern cutting, stitching, putting stuff together, draping, uh, finding ideas out for new lookbooks and new photos, uh, editorials. They, they are expanding and honing their mind so that when it's, when it's game time, they're ready to go. So maybe that is part of the reason too. He needs to kind of, you know, and again, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, designers only have to take a, a week off and then as soon as they come back, you see the amount of energy and the amount of new ideas they've got. So I can only imagine what three months is going to do. Three months, he's going to come back on fire. So again, um, hope he gets well soon. Hope he's um, able to get back on his feet and things go well. And then, yeah, we see a completely different Virgil. We see maybe a more focused Virgil. We see a Virgil that maybe is able to kind of delegate a little bit better. Um, but also see a Virgil that's able to tell the kids, look, if you want to be me, if you want to get a Louis Vuitton job, right, you have to do this. This is what you have to do. Now, you know, it might have cost him his, men- his his sanity for the most part, but sacrifice has to be made, man. How bad do you really want it, right? That is it. It's all well and good getting the 10,000 hours in, but how bad do you really, really want it? There we go, man. There we bloody go. So, yeah, get well soon, Virgil. Hopefully, he's on the mend. Next, we have here Alexa Chung and the Bird Guy. And I haven't watched this, right? So, I'm going to watch this directly with you guys. Um, I absolutely detest Alexa Chung. Nothing about her is um, cool, interesting, or funny. But I'm sure this video will bring out some sort of emotion in me. And I'm sure you viewers will get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing me get annoyed with this lady. Speak out what she's going to speak about. Now, supposedly there's something involving a Bergheim in this, which I'm going to be annoyed about straight away because my hello turf. But let's see. Let's give her a chance. Maybe it's not as bad as we think it's going to be. Um, and let's uh, play it, right? Let's see what she's got to say. This is a video titled Alexa Chung Style Challenge 5 Looks in 5 Minutes from her website. Hello everyone, I have to travel a lot. You asked me for some style tips, so I thought I'd blend right. both of those ideas into one little video. So today, I'm going to be presented with a whole slew of outfits. And I'm gonna have to- this is the thing, right? She, was, she might have been cool a couple of years ago or a few years ago, but if you're a girl nowadays and you're following Alexa Chung and you're in your you know glue to your screen she's got what 200,000 views so i don't know what i'm talking about but if you're if you're a girl nowadays and you're into style or you're into fashion and it's a challenge your style icon you gotta give your head a wobble no there's so many cool interesting girls out you don't just go to instagram type in your favorite name and you'll find a favorite brand name hashtag and you'll find a plethora of girls out there doing fucking bits on the gram wearing the sickest outfits, dropping the sickest looks, right? Sickest brands, like just murking the game out there. Why would you want to follow what Alexa Chung is wearing? That's some basic. If, they, if ever there was a basic 
B I T C H <laughs> outfit or persona, it'll be this lady, no? Nothing about her is interesting. Nothing. Nothing. Just, you know, meh. But again, let's, let's continue. I have to pick just five for five different situations before I go on my travels. Wow, a very yeah. edited selection. Thanks. Um, you your car should be here in five minutes, so it's going to be quick decisions. That's very tinnery. Thanks. Your car will be here in five minutes. You couldn't get something more detached from this, isn't it? She's got some uh, 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 a nice young, handsome man coming along, dropping a whole bag of clothes on the floor, and her car's going to be here in five minutes to take her on her travels. Fuck off. Jesus Christ. Um, and I'll come get you in the car soon. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to the airport. Ibiza for a hen night. Oi, oi, watch out. Oi, oi. Gibraltar for a wedding. I don't know who's getting married there yet. Swiss Alps for a hike. I love hiking. Thank you love hiking. You love walking up a hill. Why people love walking up hills, isn't it, and calling it hiking? <sighs> I love hiking. When's the last time she went hiking? What? Fucking, when she went to LA? And went to Runyon Canyon. Hiking my ass. Thank you so much. And Berlin to Bergheim, which is, of course, the super club there, which has a very strict door policy. And when you go in there, it's really fun and sometimes spooky. Okay. So I fucking hate her, man. I hate her so much. Berlin, Bergheim is fun and spooky. Of all the, of all the ad adjectives to use for Bergheim, fun and spooky. Fun and spooky. I don't know whose girl this is, man, but you need to, whoever's girl this is, you need to come get her. So, let's get started. Airport it is. Okay. I have favorite t-shirts. This is one of my absolute faves. I got it in LA. Wild man, wizard. So him, for sure. <sighs> I don't really subscribe to the comfy airport dressing thing. Oh, you don't subscribe to the comfy airport dressing? Yeah. What do you subscribe to then, mate, eh? Wearing Celine head to toe to the airport? Oh, great. Nice for some. Okay. Bloody hell. So Just show us what you're going to wear. Like Let's see what airport style is. Got some nice light jeans on. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. Let's fast forward a little bit. This is so boring. That's the airport it looks. That's what's that hen do? She's so dead, isn't it? She's so there's just she's got no sauce, like no sauce. That's it. She's lacking any sauce. It's all well and good doing the whole like you know kooky white girl thing, but she's got no sauce. There's nothing about her that's interesting. Zero. The only thing interesting about her is the clothes that she wears. That's you know what? That's the saddest thing. You know what? That's probably what. That's the thing. That's the thing that people don't like about hype beasts, right? They have no personality. They have no thought of their own. They're just devoid of any kind of personality, any kind of personal style choices, any kind of direction, insights, influences. Everything is just funneled through the idea of hype. If it's limited, if it's hard to get, I wear it. If Ace of Rocky wears it, I'm wearing it. That's it. And she's basically the white, Caucasian, I don't know, you know, cosmopolitan, Vogue, Britain, Vogue UK version of it, right? Just everything, any personality she has is funneled through her outfits. It's like those girls you see in Old Street that wear those amazing um, gold or silver um chelsea boots right and now you see them wearing sometimes they're branded sometimes they're not cool jacket you talk to them and they have no personality there's nothing interesting about them the only thing interesting is their clothes they're wearing they wear a, a fucking cool beret that's the personality they have they don't have any personality the personality is the clothes that they're wearing but the whole point of being chic the whole point of being stylish is that your somehow your clothing and what you wear is a representation of who you are as a person so that when I speak to you and I'm like, oh my God, I love that detail, that scarf. You're like, yeah, cool. you got a cool story to back up with that scarf. You picked it up when you went da 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 This was actually your mum's scarf who unfortunately passed away and that was the last thing she gave. you got something cool, something of relevance to back up towards it. Something of relevance to give it some sort of weight instead of just like, oh, where do you get that from? Rocket. Where do you get that from? Zara. Like, come on, give me something more, man. Oh, there's two cushions that are going to LA. Wild wizard, man. Like, don't you, did, wasn't she interested about the t-shirt, where it came from, where is it made? The style of it, the wash, nothing. Just cool wizard man t-shirt from LA. Ugh. Nice. She's so boring. You're always cold. Really? I wonder why. It's summer. Everything's lovely. This is a Do you wear a hat to a wedding? 
I'm gonna wear get <sighs> Yes. She dresses like such shit, like it's just so boring. Let's see what a Bergheim outfit's gonna look like. This this is her Berlin Bergheim outfit. Let's see how dead this looks. Okay, Bergheim, Bergheim, Bergheim. Bergheim, you're actually meant to wear black too, I think. But I don't think we've got any green. I think. Have you ever been there before? Why would you not know that? Let's see what Burkhan Affair looks like. And even and even the fucking music they put in the background of this. This this is the music they put in for for the Burkhan video. It's like something you might hear at fucking Tomorrowland, right? God almighty. That's her Burkhan look. This girl's a waste of time, man. I don't know what I I just wasted five minutes of my life watching this fucking garbage. She is trash upon trash, isn't she? Like it's a, again, but credit to her for still being relevant and still being around in 2019. Someone like Alexa Chung nowadays with the amazing influencers and YouTubers that we have now or that girls have to choose from, to still be paying attention to her, you must be really about this like boring Labrook Grove, Notting Hill. I don't know, um, children firehouse life, man. This is what you must be like. If you're still about that life, then fair play to you. But I need, I need my, I need my influences. I need my um, muses or style icons to have a bit more source of them. She's just sourceless. She's just like the opposite of Kate Moss, isn't it? Like just devoid of any like. Why would you even care what she what she wore as an outfit for a week? Why would you care, Kate Moss? Though you'd be interested, right? Why would you care what she has to wear? Why? And Kate Moss is fucking could be old enough to be a mum. Ugh, terrible. She is terrible, man. She's so boring. Just so, so boring. Like, it's just insane how boring she is. But again, it's not her fault. I wasted my own time on that one. Sorry about that, guys. But yeah, if I'll link in the show if you guys check out if you want to see it yourself. But Alexa Chung, style challenge, five looks in five minutes. I don't know who else has to do this. She's got all the views. People care about it. So, you know, maybe I'm in the minority here. Ba, 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 da, ba, ba. Talking about Berghain, I'm going to the Berghain. They'll tell you I'm going to the Berghain. They'll tell you I'm going to Berlin. I'm going to Berlin. Well, I'm going to Berlin. Hopefully, I get into the Berghain. Right? I can't assume and I can't go. I can't be so cocksure that I'm going to get in. Hopefully, I get in. Fingers crossed. But I was just checking online. I was like, oh, people were like, oh, you all wear black, all wear black. I've never, I think I've worn black maybe twice when I've gone there. The other times I've worn colors. I've had like a red jumper on, a blue t shirt. Like, I've, I've mixed up. I'm not always worn black. Um, but and when you get in there too, you see loads of different outfits. No one's just wearing black all the time. But I saw this um, little Pinterest board because I was like, oh, I wonder what people put up on Pinterest about outfits of Berlin or for Berger. And they got me thinking, okay, cool. Now it makes sense why people always think the black is the way to go. Because just taking a quick look, look at this Pinterest board, right? Not even in depth. There's a Pinterest board called What People Wear to Get into Berger. There was an exclusive nightclub. Pretty blatant to you to see. And look at it. Just like a quick glance. It's all black essentially all dark colors no light colors at all everything is dark 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 look at insane isn't it look everything is black there's no light colors at all i was like oh okay now i get why everyone says you have to wear black to get in there some of the girl looks are fucking incredible they're really nice actually i like this girl's little um with the ripped shorts and shit but yeah everything is black the whole thing This is a more of a common look you'll see when you go to Berkeley. I know I've seen it a few times I've been in there. The sort of like fishnet tights. Um, um, what do you call that? What would you call that top? I don't know. This is yeah more of a common look. I really like these pants too. But yeah, just made me laugh looking there. I was like, okay, cool, man. I guess they're right. It is actually all you know black and all the same sort of thing looking wise for the most part. Um, but yeah, loads of cool style outfits, looks there, stuff that I'm obviously not going to wear. I don't have the legs for that kind of look, unfortunately, right? It's a girl wearing some fishnet tights and some massive buffalo shoes, which are really popular, I've seen too. Whenever, whenever I check the, I'm always checking the uh, Bergheim, um location on Instagram just to check what people are posting 
you don't really get in much because you know you don't like to take pictures inside Ber- Bergen, so you don't get much. You just get some people recording audio from their f- i from their phones for the most part. But if you check the Bergheim location on Instagram, you will see the same sort of thing there too. You'll just see loads and loads and loads of outfits in black, basically the same sort of kind of you know thing that you basically see on this Pinterest board. Let me get up here for you guys to check out. Hopefully, you guys can see this. All right so on here do you go on there what you'll see is just like look look at that tons and tons of black as i'm scrolling through this is just from clicking typing basically location typing bergheim bar or bergheim panorama bar and you'll see loads of girls and boys wearing black and another big um move from the whole berlin bergheim scene as you guys have maybe found out or if you don't know supposedly they're moving away from stamps so the bergheim stamp was you know one of the most legendary things you get when you get go into the bergheim right you queue up you get past then, you pay your ticket, you get searched, you pay a ticket fee, you have a sticker over your phone. But the most important thing that you'd love was a stamp you'd get, right? And the stamp's always changed up. Nowadays, I think, or as of maybe a few weeks ago, I think they had um, the, a stamp with a faggot on it, right? There was a stamp on your arm, which was quite cool. People were posting it up. But it seems like they've made a change now. Now they're going to have these wristbands, similar to what you'd get at a festival. The kind of wristbands that have like, the two-sided sticky tape. It has the price on there, the date that you bought it on the wristband already. So I think that helps them with knowing who come in and what day you arrived and whatnot and there's also a change too because it's going to be a five euro re-entry fee because usually whenever you went to the Bergheim and you left because the whole I, the whole thing about it or the whole trick was to kind of go and get your stamp early on the friday or the saturday leave go do your thing have a nap chill out whatever it may be called and then come back on a sunday morning and party all the way until sunday morning like, oh until monday morning sorry that was the kind of vibe that you basically do, right? Um, but now they've changed it, switched it. So now everyone's wearing wristbands. It's wristbands only, which I'm, you know, not a fan of because I want the stamp. But again, you know, things have to be made. And the re-entry fee, I guess, for managing a club of that size and the amount of people that come in there is such an easy money maker from them. And also is a good way of maybe uh, herding the crowd and ensuring the people that are coming back in are actually coming back in for the right reasons right and not just coming back in to be a fucking lager louts because i'd imagine it must put them in a weird position when they already stamp somebody and you have to kind of let them back in again right but maybe the paying might thin the crowd maybe the paying might help with the queues because especially if you already paid your ticket and it's free to get back in again the queues are probably a little bit insane especially this summer i feel as if this summer was an insane time for Bergheim. like it seems like every time i was looking online there was just a mate loads of pictures being uploaded of massive queues people waiting outside so maybe that's part of the reason i'm not too sure but yeah um the Bergheim has now switched to wristbands for the most part so if you're gonna go Bergheim and you're looking forward to getting a stamp unfortunately no stamp wristbands only as you can see here from a lot of pictures people's videos I've, I've i always get the fucking pictures someone's boomerang that they've got to it's got the price on there and the date and stuff so yeah so all new all new thing there was that it's been iron stem was that stemple i don't know what that means I am whatever something but yeah you got the price on there 18 euros again such a great price for such a big mega club isn't it um loads of cool pictures of people that are posting their stuff so yeah i can't wait to go man only a few more weeks to go until i'm in the burger and myself raving away pumping my fist in the air and shouting in my head we don't care <laughs> anyways um what else is on the list here i wanted to check out da, 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 da. Oh, we got some perfect Bergheim boots, actually. These Etsy's. Etsy's, I've talked about them a lot, I think, on here. Spoke about their gender neutral brands, spoke about their boots. I think I'm going to have to take the, the, the jump in with Etsy. You know, these remind me of two, these shoes, right? These shoes are from Etsy. They've not come out yet, I don't think, but they're called, they're re releasing the Ultra Chunky Halo sneaker. I'm not sure, I think it's maybe a, something from the archives that they're kind of pulling back again. So I'm assuming everyone's getting hype over them, but um, they look really cool. I'm a big fan of them. I think they'll look amazing for my trip in Berlin if I was able to get them beforehand. So if anyone from Etsy is watching it, this little video, holla at your boy. But they look fucking cool. And they remind me a little bit of those um, Vetemont and... Uh, who, what collaboration they did it with? They did a collaboration of sneakers that they brought out a while ago, but they didn't make that many, I don't think, or they didn't sell as well. I didn't see how many people wearing them. But they look amazing. So big, really big chunky shoes. Reminds me a little bit of that. I don't know what that basketball shoe is again. That's got a similar sort of lava sort of mold on it on the top. But they look fucking cool. Cork sole. Chunky as fuck. And again, really he- probably quite heavy. They're going to be $470. So it's an article from Hypebeast here. It's called the Halo shoe, right? As you can see here from the screen. Hopefully you guys are checking it out. 
Hopefully it's on there. Is it on there? Hopefully it is, right? Um, it's called if SC continues to venture into the world of chunky footwear with the latest race of the Halo sneaker. Da, 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 da. It's going to come out when? It's, have they got a date for it yet? September the 4th. Okay, so it's out already. So if I click on Etsy site, it should be there already to check to buy, right? So let's see if we can see down the site and see how much it is in the UK price. I think it's 400, right? Oh, it's not out yet. Is it out yet? 350 pounds. God almighty, that's a lot of money, isn't it? God damn. 350. But they're fucking, they look banging though. They look a lot better than my uh, uh, triple S's, I think. I'd like to see them in person, see what they look like. But I'd wear the fuck out of these shoes, man. They look so good. Because I see a lot of people, whenever I'm, I'm tagged, whenever I'm checking the location of Burkhan, there's always people wearing the Buffalo sneakers. They look really, I think they're really popular shoe there. And obviously the Dr. Martin Jaden, which I've got a pair of. Um, but these look really nice, man. I love them. Love, love, love them. So that's a Halo sneaker. It's bold, lightweight sneaker on. Okay, quite lightweight, they're saying, which is cool. Uh, it's got a, a pylon midsole with jagged outsole, um, accentuating its uh, otherworldly silhouette. Features a distinctive square toe speed lace system and nylon hooks. Product details. Yep, stitch upper. Oh, it looks amazing, isn't it? Though? I'm a big fan of these. I think I want them, man. I think I really want them. Three fifty, though, man. It's expensive, isn't it? Expensive for well, they're expensive for a, an Etsy shoe, but not expensive for like a designer shoe, right? Because that's still a good value. Like, what chip less is going for? 600, 700 quid, right? Speed races, probably about the same as these. Um, acne trainers don't go for less than 300 for the most part. Um, come to or play, I don't know, converses, which are not, you know, again, I'm just saying trendy, fashiony shoes. These are really good, I think, for the price. Again, if you like that kind of style. I'd probably get these other buffaloes because they look a bit more different and they're a bit, you know, a little bit more unique. Something you won't see a lot of people wearing. And the buffaloes, are, again, I'm not sure the buffaloes, I like, I like the overall shape of them anyway. These look a little bit more of an athletic shoe. I love the outsole. I, and again, I just love the shape. Look how flat it looks at the front. They look incredible. I'm a big fan, actually. I quite like these. And again, you know what they remind me of the, the arch here? Are those Pradas that Jaden Jaden Smith wears a lot. It's got that big, massive arch on the sole too. But yeah, I'm a big fan of these. Um, the Etsy Halo is available now, so I recommend you check it out. Three fifty on the Etsy website. Probably will get. I'll probably a size forty four in case you're watching someone from Etsy. I'm a size forty four. Hold out your boy. What's the other colorway there? Oh, in grey too. Oof, they look bad. They look good. They look good. They look fucking good. Wow, I like them so much. And they've got that square toe that all their shoes got as well. Oh, they look fucking bang. Look, oh, it's good. Oh, it's a pulley. Okay, cool. I see. It's a pull system. Pull is like um, like the Jordans um. Jordan 6s, like zip tie basically. That's a cool, I like that, yeah. These are a really cool shoe. I recommend you check them out. Really nice Etsy Halo sneaker available now at all your local Etsy retailers. So, um, I think that might be it, you know. That's it for the show. Gave you an hour and ten of content. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If you're watching this via the YouTube app and it's your first time, give me a like and a little subscribe. That'll be go a long way in terms of making people find the show and all that malarkey. If you've got any questions, leave me a comment in the comment section. If you're listening via the podcast app, for those of you that left a review, I'm really grateful. For those of you that haven't, please leave me a five star review. Let people know how you enjoy the show so people can find it and discover it. That's how the algorithm works. And yeah, that's about it. I think for now, I, I mentioned before, I'm DJing on the weekend on Saturday, but I thought it was just a private party, so I can't really publicize the address. But if you're desperate and you really want to have a good time and come out, just send me a little message on the old email and I'll get back to you and let you know where the location is. Uh, but apart from that, I'll see you guys again tomorrow for an episode of the show. Tomorrow I'll be back again. And until then, take care, be safe, and I'll see you very soon. Peace.